you just bring your laptop up here? It's fine. Hello friends, today we're going to talk about web servers. This is a group presentation, so you know it's going to be good. Yeah, Shane's presenting the whole thing. No. Next slide. Um, before we start, a few quick things. Uh, so first, we have a competition coming up on Saturday. If you're not signed up for that, you should be. I'm not looking at anyone in particular, but... <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, sign up, have fun, it's going to be fun, it's built by Cody, so you, that's how you know it's going to be fun. So that means it'll probably work better than our environments do. Like, we have a competition and it's broken half the time, and Cody has a competition and it just works, and it's magic. Last time he had a Raspberry Pi that was running a traffic light we got to not hack. And that was really fun until Red Team nukes your Raspberry Pi, and then there wasn't a revert for that, so... Uh, Cody, Cody's happy about that. This Cody. Of course. Of course. Uh, yeah. So sign up for that. Woo! Okay. Yeah. Links in Discord. Yeah. Links in Discord. Hello. You may be wondering, what is the web? The web is what you're probably using right now to find Minecraft servers. Um, it's Google. It's Amazon. It's every website you've ever used. And a web browser is a website. Um, yeah. If you've done web dev, that's it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so why? Okay, fine. Good. So why did people choose to do the web? Why did they choose to shoehorn every single thing, every single thought they ever had into a web application? Well, great question. Uh, number one, it works on basically every platform. They made a platform for web called Chrome OS, and is it good? I, no, but they did it, and it's. If you know Java, like write once, run anywhere, you can do that. Except it's easier because you don't need to actually program. So yeah, it's very popular. And it doesn't require that many resources. And we support it in our competitions because people use it in the real world. So if you learn how web servers work, this is like the pitch, then you can set up your own website, right? Like Austin set up a website. We taught him how to do that. Okay. Um, so if you want to do CTF challenges and do the web category, because I don't want to, then you can do it. Is it fun? Sometimes. So yeah, now you can, uh, there is a VF if you signed up in CyberNet. And if you want to hop on our box, you can, but it's not recommended. Password one second. Yes, my God, my there we go. Is anyone not in the box that wants to be in the box? If you're on Windows and you, you think you can't participate, that's wrong because you can just open Terminal and it has a stage as long as you're in Windows 10 or something. Alright, is anyone still? Yeah, so uh, what is HTTP? Like, what actually is it? So it's a web server just like listens on a port, like port 80. Uh, and it's just listening with plain socket connection. And HTTP, like all your web traffic, is just text flowing back and forth over that socket connection. So you can see that image, that's what a GET request looks like. When you just like type the website into your URL bar, like localhost 1337, enter, that's what you actually send to the server. It's not some like magic whatever, well, I mean, if you call this magic, but it just sends that text to the server, and then the server knows, oh, hey, they want to get slash, like slash is where you're at. 
Um, so we can uh, we can demonstrate this with um, a so if you've ever used the command line utility netcat netcat. Um, can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. Okay, so netcat allows you to just like talk to a TCP socket. So if we, for example, netcat or devsec.club um, or a, then uh, we need to send a get password. Yeah. Right. And then you get yeah. two new lines, and then the DevSec server says you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah, so do that. But like, look at that. HTML. Boom. Type stuff, get HTML. Um, so if we do like netcat tacl 1337, if you run this on your box, then that starts netcat just listening on port 1337. You can go into your browser, do localhost uh, HTTP. Localhost 13337. Run that. Your browser is just going to hang and spin. But if you look here, boom, it just sent a request. It's saying, hey, I want to get slash. This is a bunch of parameters. So, yeah, cool stuff. Any questions? This is assuming that you are on the graphical interface. If you're SSH in the box, then you have to open two terminals or use TMS um, and then curl to yourself because there's no TCP. Yeah, wait a second. Okay, so how do you talk to this magical interweb? Um, there's a lot of options, actually. There's two. Actually, there's one. Um, you can use, from the command line, you can use curl, wget, links, or if you have a GUI, you can use Netzer. These are all super old browsers. Well, no, not super old. But no one uses them because they don't run JavaScript. Uh, you can use Firefox, which used to be super cool, but now it's increasingly less so, but it still works. Um, and then the world of Google Chrome, surrender. Questions, comments? Awesome, what do you think? That's about the best one. Well, you got Internet Explorer. No Internet Explorer. <laughs> it's dead. No edge. Are you want me to talk about this? Okay, so <clears throat> there's um, different like architectures for how a web application is set up. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. <laughs> um, so there's SSR, which is server side rendering. So that's when you like get static HTML pages. Um, like you have a web server and it has your HTML, just like index.html on there, right? And then the server goes and gets that sends it to you. And then there's uh, single page applications, which is like garbage. Because <laughs> it's JavaScript. That's our opinion. <laughs> um, sorry, that's opinion. Um, it is garbage. That's fact now. Because um, that's like where you just like go there and it's one application and it's not like you click around to different tabs and it loads a different URL, it's like garbage, it's JavaScript. Ew. Uh, there's also web sockets, which um, aren't sockets, even though it says they're sockets. It's literally just web requests in the background. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they call themselves sockets. They are kind of useful because you can send data back and forth between client and server really fast. I don't know what WebAssembly is. So WASM, you can use Inscriptin or some other garbage to compile anything, C, Go, whatever, to a binary, which will then be streamed into your browser. So you can run C in your browser. Wow. Shane really likes that one. It's OK. So <clears throat> different web stacks. So a software stack is like what the all of the software you would need or the main components of software you would need to do something. So one of the most popular ones is LAMP stack. So that's Linux. Apache, MySQL, PHP. There's also like LEMP stack, which is Linux, Nginx, MySQL, PHP. Um, and you can like exchange MySQL for MariaDB or whatever, but whatever. Uh, so MySQL is a database and that stores any data you'd have for dynamic pages. PHP is the server side uh, content rendering. So that allows you to have code that actually executes server side when you access a page. 
in doing things like loading stuff from the database to send it to you. And Apache or Nginx is the actual web server that waits for a request, gets the request, and then goes and either like calls a PHP script or goes and gets the HTML file to yeet back to you. Um, and then of course Linux is Linux. So let me go to my favorite website, yell.in. Why? And we can see right here that it knows this is the first time. Actually, no, it doesn't. Let's just go again. Well, it has the total on this. Yeah, it does. So Galen has a database, presumably, that stores all these requests, or like a JSON file. And that's the database part of it that it fetches with PHP, and the PHP is called by Apache or Nginx, whatever it uses. Um, and then that is chucked to you by the web server, so then you can read it. So they all come together in harmony. And of course, none of that could run without Linux. So <clears throat> following up on that, so CyberNet, the best application that was not written in an hour, um, uses source-side rendering with Golang. I use Gojin. And then I use SQLite for the backend. So my password, which is four letters, don't guess it, please is stored in that database, and it's fetched by Go, and then served to you by a built-in Go server. So um, that's where Nginx would go. Do you guys hash your passwords on your website? I do hash my passwords, yes. You can also see Blast MySQL. Um, and like a year ago, it was really popular to have like Node.js and MongoDB, but that's cringe. Like everything with JavaScript is gone with the wind. You're cringe. JavaScript's hey. meant to run on your browser, so if you're using it for a, a web server, that's why people do it. It is pretty cringe. Um, alternatively, yeah, Spot. No, it doesn't. Oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah. So, um, different web servers. So, we've already named Apache and Nginx. Um, but there's a bunch of other stuff you can use. Uh, so, for example, Austin really likes IIS for whatever reason, um, uh, which is bad. Don't use IIS. Uh, IIS is Microsoft Garbage Proprietary Garbage. That's what it stands for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the acronym IIS Microsoft Garbage Proprietary Garbage. It lines mm -hmm. up. Uh, yeah, we are not opinionated. This is an unbiased presentation. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> if you are in the Windows ecosystem and really love running Windows Server, then you're probably going to run IIS. Um, good luck. Uh, there, there's some other stuff. So like Cloudflare, that's like Cloudflare, Cloudflare proxy, uh, hiding the website behind their proxies. Or Lightspeed's just you know some other random partially open source application. Uh, yeah. So they use Node.js for CPTC, and their services couldn't even handle 25 threads go busting from Austin and everyone else on the team. So that's one point not to use with Daniel. <laughs> All right. So when you go to a website, and so Google has a bunch of servers, right? And that's probably a bad example. I have one server. I have one $5 DigitalOcean box. But I serve like 20 websites on it. How is that possible? How does your web server know which application to serve? So let's say I go to goring.devsec.club. This is hosted on the same machine as what is that? Well, not anymore. As questions.devsec.club, which we definitely use. So how does my web server know to give you different pages from the same box? Well, the answer is the host. So whenever you request something, it sends the host you typed in here as the host header. And then, using the configuration on Nginx, it decides which server block to use to respond to you. We'll talk more about that in the Nginx config. So in, in, in that example request, right, right there, it's the host header. So yeah, based on that, it uses virtual hosts to decide which code to execute, or which page to serve, or which magic to conduct. Concerns or questions? Where do you host the server? Nice try. It's an easy <laughs> So, uh, how do we this? Yeah. It's a password name. Maybe? No, you can't touch that. All right. So, Nginx. How do we, how do we manage Nginx? So, I mean, of course, system CTL start and stop. So, um, so if you're on Ubuntu you'll, or most other distros, you'll have system D. Let's, let's stop. Um, I think we have a patch. 
So if you're on a cool distro, you'll probably know what your service manager is. It'll probably be like service or SCD or something like that. But for most systems, it'll be system CTL. So as you saw, Galen just app installed Nginx, and it'll probably ha have an error because it will conflict with Apache. Because we don't like Apache. Yeah, we don't like Apache anymore. No longer best friends. I mean, the Apache is still open source, so like, better than IIS? Yeah. Apache Nest. Let's see this. Slow up. Oh my god, process triggers faster. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, so system CTL to start and stop it, of course. Uh, logs are going to be in var log, uh, as always. Um, that's, yeah, that's wow. Pretty handy. That's how Linux works. So you can do system CTL status and change. Okay, so we didn't have Apache. So it started um, on port 80, and I punched through a hole on. Um, Look at that. So if you want to see, if you're on our box, you can see the web server through this thing. So I'm actually routing it through the DigitalOcean box via SSH magic, um, but that's not what this location is about. So if we, uh... so by default, it's set up to talk, or serve pages out of var www HTML, which is very common. You'll see that on most distros like WordPress. It's usually always in there. Um, so I'm just in here, there's just an index page, so I just made it say hi. So if we refresh that, it says hi. Look at that. Oh my Boom. god. That is really easy to see on that screen. Wow. Okay, uh, so if we um, see var log um, nginx, in here we can see there's two logs for nginx. There's access log and error log. So if we tail tack f access log. Which will follow it. Yeah, tail tack, tail tack f follows the log. Yeah. Sometimes I do this when I send people into my website and they just watch, see if they click it. I, I do that, but with webhooks and Discord and magic. That's too much. Um, okay, well, this is going to be kind of something to see. But if someone wants to go to that site now, actually, aha, hey, someone. So when you connect a website, you're leaking your user agent, unless you set it to something, um, and your ID. Yeah, anyone want to go to this website now? Scoring.devsec.club for 4101. Four one zero one. Maybe type in browser. Oh my god! Oh, look at that. oh wow! Someone that's a, thing that's a user agent right there. I'll save it. Yeah. So so look at that. We can see <laughs> we can see logs, logs right? So some someone sending some suspicious requests. So we should probably ban that person. But the important Austin. thing is <laughs> when you see the status right here. As long as this is like a four request and a five, then you're probably okay. Because four means user error. Nice. But five means server error. So if something's 500-ing or 200-ing for a request like that, then you're probably um, not in a good place. Okay, well. This thing now. Okay. Yeah, apparently the log's fine. These guys. Can we get, do you guys have any errors? No. We don't have any errors because we're not serving anything. But if you have okay. PHP um, and something messes up, then you'll see. So the config for Nginx is going to be, we can do that, uh, Etsy and Nginx. So right here, this is all the config. So when you want to set up like a website to use Nginx and configure the pages for that site, you can plop that into sites-enabled. And I mean, really, you should put the config into sites available and then link it in sites-enabled. No. So I mean, that's what you should do. But that allows you to have like all, all the pages that you could potentially serve in sites available, and then you just, uh, yeah, there we go. And then you can have, when you want to enable one of them, you just like link it over into sites enabled. Kind of cool. That's best practices, so you can have a list of sites you want to serve and then link it somewhere. Yeah, and that way you can like disable a site so it's not served anymore from your web server, but you still have the config for it, so, you know, yeah. Woo, um, so uh, if we go, Let's see, we can edit that config. So right here, uh, oh, this is gonna be fun. Too much documentation. So, let's, there we go. Let me connect to the screen as well. 
So right here, there's a lot of comments and docs explaining what stuff does. But you can see we have this server clause right here. And that's like, hey, this is a server. We're serving pages. And then it's like less than 80. So that's like, we're listening on port 80. And haha, that was complicated. Default server. So in Nginx, you have to have a default server specified. And that's going to be what pages get served if it doesn't match any other virtual host. So now if we had another page, we could put, um, where is it? Is it right there? Yeah, there we go. Server name right here. We could change this to like mywebsite.com, right, on a different virtual host. And then that's where the traffic would go if you type in mywebsite.com. But if you just type in the IP, then it would go to your default. If you don't have a default, it actually sorts it alphabetically. Um, so specify default. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's also, that's not the one. <laughs> there's also the, uh, the main config, nginx.com. So this is where you can set, like, server-wide properties. And if you look down here, um, right here, you can see that there's actually this directive right here to include Nginx sites enabled star. So internally, you could like actually change this and then have your sites enabled directory be a different directory. So basically what this does is it just takes all of those server directives you have and just sticks them into the config right here. So you know, if Red Team wanted to be sneaky or something, they could add a server directory right here. That'd be cool. Sneak. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Apache. Okay, uh, so I don't use Apache, but you can. It's legal, um, and this is the classic L. This is classic A in the LAMP stack. Um, so we don't actually have it installed. So that's how you do it. Something you might run into if you have a CentOS or Red Hat based system. This will be called HTTPD, and that's how you know it's really old because it's just the name of the service. Um, but it's cool, I guess. It's simple, and you see it failed right there because it can't listen on port 80, because we already have Nginx listening on port 80. So that's cool, I guess. I don't want to wait for this to finish, I'm just going to background it. And then ignore that. So if we go to Apache 2, we see that it's much the same. It has an Apache2.com, which gives you more documentation than I would ever want to read, and some things. So if you're trying to harden your server, you might like lower the timeout, or if someone's running a PHP shell, you don't want that, you might lower Oh, maybe not. That'd probably be in PHP I9. But you get my point. Um, and then there's this stuff. So have you ever seen like an open index where it like lists all the files in a directory? Yeah, like that. Um, this is where you would set it. So if I didn't want that, for example, I could just delete that. Or if I didn't want things in this directory to link to other things, I could delete that. And that's all it is. Uh, yeah, so otherwise it has the same paradigm with sites enabled and sites available. So we have this file, which tells me that I'm serving things out of rwwhtml, which is, again, standard. And the same log directories and that. So everything is the same. Yeah, so if you're looking for security stuff, there's a whole other folder. So you know how we do sites enabled, sites available? There's conf enabled and conf available. So again, you can look it through that if you want to. You might be interested in security.conf as a security-minded individual. So when you talk to a server, it responds with its header, like, hey, I'm Apache. If you don't want that, you could turn it off here. You can do that with Nginx, but it's harder. Read the docs, yeah. Boring modules, who cares? Um, yeah, so obviously our presentation is not inclusive. It does not tell you everything to do. Um, and you can also make a lot of mistakes. So. PHP, woo! So I unsarcastically like PHP. Um, you might have heard PHP as that language of PHP as that language that no one likes. Uh, I don't know why JavaScript is way worse. So um, you have your website, right? You have your web server like Apache Nginx, whatever IIS garbage you're running. Uh, you have some static HTML files, but then what happens if you want to like actually do stuff on the server? Well, then you need PHP or one of these other things that's used much less often than PHP. So PHP has um, market cap by a small margin of 
what's that, 70%. Uh, so PHP uh, runs stuff on the back end of your server. And it's, you have files that are just like your HTML files, except you can have like PHP statements in them. And then when the server is loading that file to send it, it executes code in those PHP statements. So that could be fun if you wanted to like, you know, import images from a database or something. Could be less fun if there's like a web shell in there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, 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 like my website, right? So on my website, look at that. This number just incremented right there. You might have seen that. It was three and now it's four. That's because I went to my website on my phone. Uh, yeah, cool stuff. And before it was two. Okay, cool. You got a Discord message for every time. I also get a Discord message. Yeah, see that Discord message? <laughs> um, it is so bad. Uh, so yeah, PHP. So. PHP, um, people really like PHP when they're trying to hack you because people don't really know how to use PHP a lot of the time. Um, and it's just like any file in your web directory that has PHP code in it and is in an executable format. So that's like .php or like six other ones that work. And then some, depending on how your server is configured, it might execute HTML files as PHP too. Um, any of those files could have just a little snippet of PHP code in there that uh, gives them code execution on your system. So if they're able to like upload a file to your web server, they might upload a PHP script, like a phony shell or something. Not that I've ever uploaded a phony shell to someone's server, but like, uh, yeah. If someone logs into your WordPress site, which I know you're all running a WordPress site, then they can edit the theme, and the theme can include PHP. So just by having a login on your website, they can, go, they can gain code execution by adding a snippet of the theme. So that's cool. Okay. Yeah, so uh, in the PHP config, it's php.ini. It's this painfully long, like 2,000 line long file for some reason. It's like maybe, I don't know, server side code's complicated or something. Yeah. Um, but there's a bunch of things you can specify. And these are a few important ones. So you can do things like not allow people to F open URLs. If you think about that, do you want your web server to be able to access your, like pull URLs from other places? Probably not. Um, you can change your execution time limit and memory limit, so that's like, you know, pretty self-explanatory, hopefully. Uh, you can disable file uploads. Probably useful if you have a site that doesn't need file uploads. You can change your base directory, which means that um, PHP will not execute any scripts that are outside of that directory. So somehow you've got a link in that directory to a PHP script outside of that that someone could write to or, I don't know. Regardless, it won't execute PHP that's not in that directory or a subdirectory of that directory. Uh, you can tell it to not display errors. So if you've ever been on a site, I don't have one that's up, but there's like PHP errors and it's like error, you have an error on line 24. Uh, you probably don't want that displayed in production. Um, and then this is the really big one. Uh, you can disable functions and there's a lot of functions to disable in case you can't tell by me. It's six pixels up. <laughs> dramatically making it go off the screen in like six point font. Uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot of functions to disable, um, but that allows you to, uh, that if you set a bunch of disabled functions and there's lists of them online that you can look up or just copy this list out, then that should kill most web shells. So if someone gets a PHP script on your server, uh, it'll be able to execute, but it won't have the same uh, capabilities. So when you talk to a web server, as you saw, it's just plain text. Um, so everyone can see what you're getting and what you get back. So here's a neat thing to show you. Um, if you didn't know, you can access these developer things. And you can see, you can see what request you're making. So right here I see I got, I get this at that, and that's just parsing it, but I can see it raw if I do this. So I get this, and then here are all my headers. And then when I send it, I check the response, and I get, okay, it rendered it, thanks. I get this back. So if you're not encrypting your traffic, you can see everything that someone is connected to. So they added an S on it and called it secure because they wrapped it in a TLS one. But you may be wondering, how do I trust? You, I know you're experts of public tree cryptography, um, so how do you know when you want to trust someone's signed certificate? Well, all the people got together and they were like, let's make it expensive. Um, so they 
made certificate authorities and then installed their root certificates in common machines. Or like your Windows install that you got when you were 10. Um, and more recently, that used to be expensive, but the, a new organization called Let's Encrypt makes you do it, or lets you do it for free. So it's no longer expensive, so you should um, generate certificates for your web servers because they're encrypted. So if you're wondering like why would you need to verify at all, like you're just like, I want a secure connection to my website. Well, if you have a secure connection to your website, that implies that like there's a login page or there's some data that you don't want everyone to see. Like, you know, I don't really care if everyone sees my like, hi, I have a Minecraft server, right? But now if there's logins on that page or something like that, or it's your bank, you're gonna want that to be secure. So the idea with like signing it is if you have a site that needs to be secure, there's probably important data on there. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're sending that important data to the right person. So signing it allows them to say like, hey, yes, I am yourbank.com and that's verified. So if someone was like got a man in the middle attack on you and put some box in the middle that was intercepting your traffic, you get back the certificate and it's like, yes, I am yourbank.com. And it says that they say themselves are your bank or something like that and you're like, huh. That's kind of sus. Your browser yeah. will warn you. That's that big, like, X, big lock X, I don't know. I think it's, it's like all red and slow saying secure. Yeah, like, there's a bunch of crypto magic that goes on. I don't I don't think anyone really understands it except uh, Ben. That's um, this thing, like, oh no, the certificate is not valid. It's for a different site. Uh, so if you see this, don't enter your bank credits. Unless you want to. In, unless you want to, in which case you're probably giving them to me, and I thank you. Essentially, let's encrypt if you want a cert, is the takeaway. This is supposed to be easy, yes. Okay, we're gonna ignore that. This is what I just talked about. So, um, there's a bot you can install on your Linux machine, so on my Windows, um, and you can run it, and then it will say, what do you want to cert for? And then you just press the button and it does it for you. So, there's really no excuse to not have it, unless you're not processing any sensitive information. And I mean, even still, just like slap a certificate on it. It's so easy nowadays. Yeah. I have a certificate on my profile. I don't need one on here, but like, do be aware there's that a certificate. If you have a certificate to a subdomain that you don't want people to know, then people will know that the subdomain is. Ooh, yeah, that's fun. So if you do go to, uh, what's it, crt.sh, this is fun. Oh, I'm going to DOS myself here. So if you type in, um, a website that's got a certificate from Let's Encrypt and wait about two and a half business years for it to load, uh, then you can see every single like subdomain that's ever been registered under that and the exact date when that certificate was generated. Kind of cool. You like. <laughs> Let's leak all of Shane's private secret subdomains. Get run away. So you can see we have like link.defsec.club and cybernet.defsec.club and wiki.defsec.club. Speaking of which, you should check out all of those. Check out the wiki. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sometimes for CTF challenges, they'll give you a domain um, and you have to go look up here and they generated some random subdomain like cody.defsec.club that they generated two years ago and you're supposed to then go to that subdomain and like boom, there's your flag. Tangential, but good to know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool stuff. It's public record, so uh, yeah, just like my fourth that created. <laughs> so <laughs> if you don't have no money, if you're so poor that you don't even have zero dollars, then you can generate your own certificate um, with OpenSSL, and then the same thing will pop up. That's what you saw with Dan's Jake Minecraft server. You know, surprise. That's what you saw with this, and then this is saying, uh. This cert is jank, but you can still accept it. And it says that's still a lie. <laughs> so, you didn't get a real certificate authority. Like, if Cody was my authority, I'm like, sign my cert, please. If I didn't do that and just signed myself, I would see this. So, you get that a lot of times on like the PFSense interface or Apollo interface or web interface for whatever other embedded application you have. So Nginx is a web server, but it's also a reverse proxy. So I have a bunch of crap running that I don't want. So Go has a built-in web server with GoGin, and I don't want it to be exposed to the internet, and I don't want to have like 40 billion different ports. 
I want to use virtual host. So I use Nginx as a reverse proxy to proxy the web traffic to the local process. Thoughts? So uh, you can see right here, the whatever Jank he has running in Go is running locally, listening on this port, right? And then in the Nginx config, you specify that this questions.devsec.club gets redirected to here internally. So it like proxies it through the web server. Kind of cool. Kind of useful if you're running some super jank setup and need to proxy stuff locally. Or this is cool because this allows you to like run a Flask, or you shouldn't be using Flask in production, but some like a Go web server or something, some application that runs a web server itself. And then you can still only run Nginx as your web server, but then you just like proxy it inside. You don't have to like do some weird jank to make questions.devsec.club go to your different applications. Nginx just does it for you. It's cool stuff. So, speaking of that. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some real world setups. Um, the, real world. Th this is production. Like we, we just copied this out of the server config and censored 20 lines. To we are professionals. Everything, we never made a mistake. So here's the DevSec Club file. This is in a file called DevSec.site on my DigitalOcean box, which Daniel will never find. Uh, and you see it's pretty simple. At the top, I have the listen AD, and that's the catch-all. It's a redirect to HTTPS. So if you try to go to anything.devsec.club, it'll redirect you to the HTTPS equivalent. Um, and then the second thing is our real website, which no longer lives on that box, so this is kind of old. But it's just saying, serve files out of off DevSec, the root, just plain HTML files. There's no rendering, there's no magic, it's just plain HTML. And then the third thing is questions, which as we saw before, I'm proxy passing via magic to my internal application, which is listening on 1157. So instead of having to go to devsec.club1157, you just go to questions.devsec.club, which is cool. Speaking of real world setups, um, Galen's bad practices. Uh, so this is mostly snippets from my web server. If you can find the uh, shell, then congratulations. Um, so again, I have that same thing to upgrade to HTTPS, but then um, for mine, I use PHP. So right here, this is saying, wait, I can do it. Lasers. Lasers. Um, so right here, we have um, for location slash, uh, which is like basically anything, um, I want to serve this PHP file. So if you go to my website, um, and you notice you go to like, gal.in slash abcde, you'll still get the same page, uh, and that's because I just take everything and push it into the same PHP file. Uh, yeah, fun stuff. I also um, remember that include thing in the Nginx config, so you can include other in server the server sections as well. So for example, um, on any subdomain I have, uh, I allow people to access the favicon um, and robots.txt. Um, if you go to search.php, you get 444, which is a code in Nginx to just return nothing. Um, and if you have anything that matches that regex, which is you're trying to hack me, then I IP ban you. It doesn't actually IP ban you, it just says like sad face, please no hacks. I want to try that. It doesn't actually IP ban you because I'm lazy. I was going to make it catch that, but then I'm lazy. Uh, yeah. All right, Austin, get up here. Austin? How much to talk about? It's just Apache. Uh, so if you know uh, Johnny, he always talks about uh, the amazing Trojan Connect. We well, have a server of uh, his own, so it's hosted uh, locally on mine. But, well, not locally, but I'm forwarding it through my server, so it's like poked outside from DS's. DS use, um, internet where his Raspberry Pi is hosted that actually runs it. So you can see um, the superior Apache. Uh, I prefer this formatting. I don't know what you'd even call it, but I prefer this over NGINC with the stupid curly braces and stuff. It's just, it looks so much nicer. Um, like th there's a lot of oh, options. That it's just more straightforward. Uh, and on the left, uh, there's just an example of what Apache's like root directory looks like. Just where you can see all your config files and um, <laughs> to ignore that, I've never stolen $10 million in my life. It was only nine, so um, that's all I got. But uh, you, you can see there, it's the same uh, proxy pass thing. Which... 
Wagers. Same, same type thing, proxy pass to like local host, but he uses a jank SSH tunnel and stuff to punch that out. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if you've never run a web server before, you should do it. It's pretty cheap. I mean, you could just go get a Raspberry Pi for like five or ten bucks and put a web server on. You don't even need a domain. Uh, or you could get a domain, which is also really cheap. Uh, that's per year. So like 14 bucks a year, that's, that's, that's pretty cheap. That's like three coffees or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, but you should do it. It's fun. Great experience. Uh, don't get yourself hacked, though. So, uh, actually, like, secure your PHP and don't just leave a shell on your server. You can host a web server on your home network um, if you punch a hole through with NAT. So let it be known. Yeah, or you could just, like, host a web server for yourself and go to it and be like, haha, I have my own website, which is super fun. Or if you have $5 a month or less, you can purchase a DTS on the internet, which is what I've been doing. Yeah, DigitalOcean, pretty cheap. Or you get a free $100 from GitHub. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, if, if you yeah. have the GitHub student developer pack or whatever. If you're a shill, then you can get free DigitalOcean for over a year or something. Yeah. If you're in hack, thank you. Uh, any questions? So does 138-247-12102 sound familiar? Oh, that's what the IP address was listed as devsec.12. Yeah, that's the box we have in IA lab hosting devsec.12. I see. Yeah, it's no longer like the logical box. Thanks for that. Sourq.com is a digital. Oh, if you uh, if you on that one next. He tried. He tried. If you decrement that IP by one, that's our VPN box. Look at this. Oh my god. Go to go to snake.pdf. Oh, snake game. Second invitation. <laughs> I'll submit it. I can have it on email. Huh. Remove it. Thanks for snake. Snake game. <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, you can do this. Is it legal? It shouldn't be. Look at this. Like, what's happening over here? Anyway. My regulation. <laughs> the world's your, is your oyster. Yeah, uh, any, any questions, comments, concerns? Anyone got anything else? Insults. Audience Insults. interaction? No. Yeah. What's your favorite color? Blue, thank you for asking. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's just because of the thing. What was the GitHub thing you were talking about? Um, so there's a student pack for GitHub. So if you sell your soul to GitHub, they'll give you some cool things. And all they need is a, a, a dot .edu. Yeah, they give you like a bunch of random crap for free. Yeah, so you get JetBrains for free, which means you can get like a good IDE for free. You get hundred dollars in DigitalOcean. There's already a good IDE. It's called BIM, but yes, you can get a DigitalOcean. You also get like some free domains, I think. I mean, so if you just want to serve up like a pretty basic web page, you can probably just use GitHub Pages. Yeah. yeah. If you're serving yeah. a static website that is not doing dynamic processing, you can I never use knew my soul was worth this well. much. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you see, the thing is, you're, all of these, they give you an educational whatever license. So like JetBrains, you have an educational license. So they want to get you hooked on all these wonderful products. And then you get out of school, and you're like, oh, crap, I can't do anything without my products. And then you go spend money. That's what the web server's for, though. Yeah, they, they want to get, like, if you have all of your infrastructure set up in DigitalOcean, that's like five hours of talking to Eric to get that moved out, right? <laughs> I'm like, D does any of you guys want to spend five hours talking to Eric? I mean, you should, because he's a nice guy. But I do that with Eric, but... I, I do that as the guy that runs the IA labs. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you know. Yeah, er Eric's the uh, cloud man that Matt Me neither. Made his lab. He's made a class. He taught, my, he taught my hardware class. I've never seen him. Yeah. Awesome. What? Um, yeah. A anything else? Austin, say something. Say it All right. Thank you.